Yo, everybody, welcome to Off Panel, a weekly interview podcast about all things comics brought to you by Sketch.com. I'm your host, David Harper, and this week's guest is the artist of the image series Adventure Man. It's Terry Dodson. Thanks for coming on, Terry. Hey, David. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. So I think it's really funny. I'm not funny, but it's a little weird that the first time you came on this podcast was on, like, it aired on March 16th of 2020. And it was, like, right before the pandemic got really weird, right as it was happening. What have you been up to last year? How's it been? How how are things going? (laughs) Are you surviving? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think one of the ideal jobs to have during a pandemic, at least this one, is to be a comic book artist and be... An employee, I guess, for working comic book artist because my life in general is exactly the same because I work at home. My wife works at home. We don't have kids. And we live in a place outside of the city. So um, the number of people that I run into uh, or whatever is so limited that uh, it, it, we're very unaffected by it in general. Obviously, there's things that go on that do affect us. But yeah. Um, it's been a it's been good to be as busy as I've been, and I've been like this has probably been the busiest year was a year and a half in my comic career. Interesting. I don't think been, yeah. Well, it's the problem you know when you when you're doing your own book, create your own book, there's always other things to do, and then when you have extra time because you can't go places, you're not going to conventions. I spend that time working, and I took on extra work, but. Uh, I filled in all that gaps, all that gap time with with work, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm ready for a break. <laughs> <laughs> and now that things kind of closed back up again. It's like it's it's tough to get back out again. I mean, in Oregon, it's not bad. I mean, like, there's a lot of places that we can go. Uh, the masks masks have been in like a, in effect for the last four or five weeks. So, and, uh, my wife and I are both vaccinated, so we feel fairly safe going places. But uh, still. Um, I'm still working, still busy. You know, mm-hmm. this next arc of Adventure Man's keeping me really busy. And um, yeah, it, it 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 has been an epic work year in that time. I think it's really funny that you're saying that you're ready for a break, right? As like for us as readers, Adventure Man is just coming back. That's like one right. of the weird things about comics. It's like, where's Terry? And you've been like, I've been super busy. Now I'm ready for break time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that's hilarious. It's like I have a feeling that people assume I've just been like. Um, on vacation for nine months, which is, this is what the schedule for adventure, man, you know, we talked in March and I was in March of 2020 as wrapping up. I had drawn the bulk of adventure man by March, 2020. I hadn't colored hardly any of it though. And you've been working on it for a while before then too, right? Exactly. I've been working on it for a couple of years. Um, but I was finishing as wrapping up, uh, X-Men fantastic four, uh, at that point. And then as soon as that got wrapped up, I started coloring Adventure Man and then Adventure Man got pushed out two months because of COVID because Diamond shut down. So actually it really benefited me because it allowed me to put the time and quality into the coloring of Adventure Man that I wanted. And so I worked on Adventure Man colors, covers and art corrections and changes that we, we found and and, and the design that we did with Leonardo Oleo uh, between uh, April and September. And once I finished, once I finished Adventure Man, I spent two weeks, two full weeks, like 14 straight days getting the uh, collection together. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had to do a new cover for the U.S. version, a new cover for the uh, French version. Plus, Leonardo and I, you know, totally redesigned that book. Uh, you know, uh, layout and end pages and um, resizing things. And uh, it was epic work. So that was through September. And then I took six weeks off from Adventure Man, in which time I drew covers and an eight-page um Batman Black and White with uh, Becky Cloonan. Uh, and then like mid-October 2020, I was back in, on Adventure Man. So that's almost a year straight that I've been working on Adventure Man for year two. Mm-hmm. So the, I've really been working on Adventure Man for like three or four years now with about a six <laughs> week break in between, in which I was really working during the height of COVID again. So um, I have to say, if that was you vacationing, you're doing a very bad job of vacationing. Yes, I, I've I've learned that. <laughs> in normal times, I, I I for my health and mental well being and you know Rachel's health and well being is we schedule in this stuff and uh, in those breaks. Uh, but this you know we we we've been doing um, really short like three day breaks, which has been nice. But um, yeah, I'm I'm really could use a a, a proper normal regular yeah. <laughs> 
14 day vacation, uh, well deserved and just I think more necessary than anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, let's jump into some Adventure Man specific stuff. Uh, so for listeners that don't know, it's your image series with Matt Fraction, Rachel Dodson, Clayton Cowles, uh, Leonardo Aleo, who you already mentioned, and Turner Lobey is the editor. And actually, this is funny. I was reading when I was reading the backup, like the the, the write up the team does in the back of the book. I realized that you your team, whenever you write it out, it's always stylized where it's like. Adventure Man with an exclamation point at the end? Right. Do you pronounce the exclamation point in the title? Is it like Adventure Man when you say it? Or is it uh is it more straightforward than that? How do you say you it know, in your head? Uh, I'd say up until I would say up until we went to press almost. The t- the book, title of the book was Adventure Man with an exclamation point. The, yeah, the covers don't have the exclamation point. Right. And then we decided to drop the exclamation point. And so I think it still kind of lingers there, but now it it, it sands uh, exclamation point. We're not using it anymore. So if it shows up, it's just out of out of uh, out of habit. Yeah, yeah. So for listeners that don't know, I'm going to do a quick spiel. I think this is the one from the the collection. Everyone knows the story of how Adventure Man, the greatest pulp hero of all time, ended in a heartbreaking cliffhanger with our hero facing his very execution. Now learn the startling truth about how 80 years after his seeming demise, single mother Claire and her adventure fan son Tommy light the spark of resurrection. Can these inheritors of the Adventure Man legacy rise up to face down the evil that bested the original? So it's basically, it's this the single mother Claire effectively, I mean... I guess, spoiler alert for Adventure Man, but becoming Adventure Man to a certain degree. Adventure Mom, Adventure, all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Matt's daughter calls the book Adventure Mom, and we... we, Matt Matt created this book, really, for his daughter. It's the only book that... um, he realized he had he didn't have a book that his 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 children could read, and and by the time we got around to this, it was really for his daughter. It was the Wonder Woman book that... uh, for her, or whatever. And Mm -hmm. so... uh, And she, she is... She took on the Adventure Mom label or created that and, that and that's what matt and i keep joking about and obviously tom i think tom even says it in the story yeah i think he says it in issue five i want to say but either way yeah. it just is coming back on uh september 29th the last issue is on october 7th and i gotta say october 7th of 2020 i have to say it was absolutely a delight to have adventure man back it's i don't know it's such a fun book and it's I know I'm pretty sure I mentioned this to you last time, but it's one of those interesting books in the sense that as I read it, I'm not just thinking about the fact that I think it's fun, but I also read it and think, I think you guys are having fun too, which is, you don't really get that a lot when you're reading comics. It's like, it's always a job and you know, you enjoy it to varying degrees. But when I read it, it like radiates off the page. It feels like everyone's having a blast on it. Yeah, I, I really think so. I think, um, you know, um, Matt was excited about it, but I, I think I helped light a spark in him with my excitement about it because I could see the potential. There's so much stuff that I liked and wanted to bring to the page that I hadn't had a chance yet or to play around more with more design, architecture, um, character design, uh, acting, coloring. Just so many things I wanted to play with that this book gave me that outlet for. Um, it had been a while since I'd had this much I was on the the, project that allowed me to do the things I really felt like doing then or, you know, to scratch the itches that I had. And uh, I think that lit a fire under Matt, seeing him seeing the enthusiasm that I put into the pages and the design work. And then I think what really, really helped him get onto my levels when he started seeing my the color pages, because he'd seen I had drawn basically the whole book, you know, 140 pages before I really started coloring it. So. That, that and I knew what the colors were going to look like, but he just didn't know what I was going to do. And I think I really surprised him with what I did on the coloring. And it really opened up that world to him. And he actually ended up coming back and completely uh, rescripting a lot of the book and um, changing characters, a lot of character stuff because he saw the world how it was really going to be seen. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was it, it's it's really cool how we kind of try to one up each other. In, in a in a good way, in a positive way, that when one an idea one of us has that's an idea, it leads to like three more ideas, and we expand upon that. Um, so yeah, it, it is a blast doing this book. Uh, I just came off of uh, I had some computer problems in August, and um, I lost ten days of work. And what and what that meant was I had to work like sixteen straight days, nine hour days, which 
I don't have to do anymore. I, I've done that. I put my I put my month long work in. I don't in, at this point in my career. I, I schedule myself so that does not happen. But I've worked you know, was 15, 16, nine hour days uh, standing in front of my computer uh, to coloring issue five of Adventure Man because it had to get done. There was no other uh, choice. And as I was doing it, I was thinking, there's no other thing I would work this hard for except for this book. Right. <laughs> it was like, I'm having so much fun, even though, you know, I've been looking at a computer screen for 12 straight days um, and uh, missing the last part of summer. But um, it was completely worth it because uh, it was such a delight to be in that world. And, you know, when you're working in the color part of all this work that we've already, all this hard work we've done in line art now, and I'm putting the kind of the cherry on top and uh, really bring it to life. It, uh, it, uh, it, it was a blast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it felt great, great with how that, how it turned out. So I am interested in, in what you were saying there about how colors change things for, for Matt when he saw that. And I had seen some of the stuff black and white. I can totally feel what, you know, how that changed things for Matt. But for you, I am interested in that step of the process. How does how do like colors change things for you? Do you feel like that is a disproportionately important step in the process for you in achieving the feel and look that you're really trying to accomplish? Yeah, it's huge. It's you know my 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 background, my art education. I'm essentially self taught, but my art education is, is painting. I, I did four, uh, almost four years of painting in college, and the thing is, I came out of that straight into drawing comic books, drawing or penciling comic books. And so I went from painting to penciling, you know, simultaneously, basically. And so there was this, my whole career, I had um, a desire to color myself because that's how I saw everything was full color. Um, and then when Photoshop came along or I had, a, finally was able to play with it in about 2001, um, I really started experimenting with it going, this is now I can finally do what I want to do. And then it was a matter of, um, uh, of time of getting my my comic book speed up that I could that I could um, color myself, um, but I draw for color. Everything I do, um, you know, all the blacks are put in a certain way. The amount of line art I put on, everything is done to set myself up for coloring. And I'm learning more and more what the smartest way to do that is. But my line art is there simply for me to scan in and color. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's basically a guide, like a like a coloring book, and it's not a coloring book because <laughs> it's more complex than that. But that is essentially what I'm doing for myself. I give myself a coloring book that I know that I, how I'm going to fill it in. It's kind of interesting. It's like uh, I've always talked to artists, and they'll say things like uh, layouts are always the toughest part because, like, you really have to think about the storytelling and make sure everything's good. And then once you get into like inking, inking is kind of I mean, I guess it depends on who you are, but inking can be more of like the relaxing phase. Mm -hmm. It's like you're going through and it's just like you're, you know, it's just kind of fulfilling the work you've already done. And right. coloring, I mean, for the people I talk to with colors, it's interesting because it can vary wildly from like, you know, getting like this is just a step in the process and getting the work done to like this is like the most almost the most work or thought that goes into it. For you is like, is, is that part more of column A or more of column B where it's, you know, because it's so important, it takes a lot of your brain to go into that. Yeah, it's it's both. Honestly, I mean, it's a dumb answer, but it, it is both. It's I know what I want in general. You know, I don't always know because I don't spend all my time coloring, but I know what I want in general. And so when I know what I want, it goes pretty quick. When I don't know what I want, it can be a real challenge. But the thing is, that's some of the best stuff when I don't know what I want and I'm just playing around and then something, a happy accident happens. It's like, Oh, that's so cool. Now, now, now I can go. Um, and what, but what I do find is that coloring, once I know how I'm going to handle something, it goes extremely quick and it's extremely satisfying. So it feels to me like what most like cartoonists feel like where they can just do something fairly effortlessly or, or inking. Like, you know, when I ink, it's the same thing where it's, it's like, I could do this, uh, so much faster than, than penciling. Penciling is labor intensive, thought intensive it's the most difficult time consuming part of the process mm -hmm. but the coloring i think i'll battle a page and once that page is figured out then i can use that that battle that i fought and won now i can use it for five more pages i don't have to fight that battle again so i figured out the lighting i feel it figured out the the temperatures and all that kind of stuff once that's figured out it goes really quick and and it was humongous me having to 
to, to finish the, or color that fifth issue was huge having the first four issues to reference off of. Right. If, if I didn't have that reference, since this the store, the five issue really ties up the first four issues. So there really wasn't much in there that I didn't already know what the palettes and everything was going to, what's going to be. And that was, that was a lifesaver. I imagine it probably helped too, that it was like mostly in one environment. I mean, it was a lot of exactly. it was the Baroness Bazaar versus uh, Claire and, you know, assorted others and everything like that. And so having that one environment, it's like you said, it's like once you figure out the one, then the next four or five pages, you know, a little bit more easy. Right. In this case, I imagine, I mean, a lot of the issues taking place kind of in like the similar lighting. So you can kind of work off of what you established from the beginning. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And uh, and now with issue um, issue six, we have new settings and um, and uh, atmospheres and stuff. And um, so it's a new challenges. But now I have kind of my I have my my um, formula, I guess I'll call it that how I'm how I'm, how I'm coloring Adventure Man. I, I know all Adventure Man, no matter what the, the setting is or the, the day or whatever, there's a certain ways I will light things, um, uh, and color things no matter where or when I am. Mm -hmm. Um, but then it's, then the fun part is that, okay, what, now that I'm in this different place, what, what's the, what's this palette going to be? What's mm -hmm. this, how much, how much, how full color am I going to be? And how mon monochromatic am I going to be? A trick that I'm using, uh, so far is that when we go into flashbacks, they go fairly monochromatic. And when we're in present day, I go, full color mm -hmm. and that's varies um monochromatic is something is a really fun way to work um it's super simple once you decide on that palette and stick with it it you can just fly and it looks it looks amazing it's so cool to go man i'm only using like two colors here. <laughs> saves me all this time but it looks so rich and you know i'm learning i'm learning uh simplicity is like the less i do really the better it looks yeah you know quit, quit rendering so much and just let let the artwork that Rachel did an amazing job on these amazing blacks, amazing uh, ink lines. Let those things show um, because it's it's shocking sometimes to see how our work looks when you see the black and white pages after seeing just the color. It's 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 amazing to see the quality and detail and just gorgeousness of uh, Rachel's inking. And a lot of times that gets lost. So um, I'm trying to. Uh, make sure that to let our pages do the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I imagine that the monochromatic also, in some situations, probably really helps like the main elements pop even more than they were before. Yeah, and control it really helps you control the storytelling, control your eyes, control the um, control the uh, where the eye looks, you know, mm -hmm. the focus. Points. It's it's great. It's it's um it's something that could probably be done a lot more in mainstream comics uh, to help people out. But it you know it's 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 the tool that I'm going to use for Adventure Man because um it I believe over time it'll really give it that distinct um Adventure Man look whatever that whatever that means. I also think it fits the vibe like the whole pulpy type vibe and everything. But exactly, I do want to latch onto one thing that you were saying there because okay, so you said you finished five, like you had that whole was that you said, uh, October of last year. Oh, no, uh, five, uh, f four came out. Four October came out. 7th, 2020. Yeah. 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 And I, and I finished that in, let's say, mid August of 2020. There was actually a real a long gap there in printing for some reason. When was five done? Uh, uh, five, I finished five in probably January or February. Okay. But I, but I just colored it in, in August. It is interesting because, okay, so like the first four issues, like are the are what the collection is, and then the fifth issue finishes that story for all intents and purposes. It is like when well, you know not finishes it, but it's like the wrap of that one. Right. And it is interesting because it's like you were you were done with you know five in like January February, and then it's now coming out in September, and you know we're gonna get into some of the stuff that was written in the back of the fifth issue about kind of how you're all thinking about the process. But was part of the reason why you all didn't want to release five and like kind of have another gap until the next arc starts. Was that because you didn't want to bring it back, finish that arc and then have another gap? Was it, was it like yeah. that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think when we were planning, when we were planning the release of the book, we didn't realize there was going to be so many pages that, you know, those first four page, first four. It's like 136 books. or 116 or something. 142. Oh, damn. That's an average of like 30. It's an average of 35 plus pages. And that 
is not sustainable <laughs> for anybody. Well, not for me. Okay. I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, most books are 20 pages and ours were 30, average of 35 and I was coloring it. So I had only planned out those. I mean, my time was up. I needed to take a break. And Matt goes, I think we still might have some story to go, but we can finish that in the next arc. It was a good, it was a good way. I think we liked the idea of kind of, kind of editing our arcs, our collections on cliffhangers. Mm -hmm. We liked that it doesn't just end in a nice clean. We, we like the idea that this is, it's the, it's the heart of the pulp, you know, that it's a cliffhanger. And so even though you've just read this 142 page collection, you feel like you should be able to stop. We kind of want you to be excited for what comes next and trying to set that up. And so having the fifth issue be like it was, I think Matt added a bit more to it to make it feel like a full ending for the initial arc, but then set up all the stuff for the, for the next year of, of, of adventure man. Mm -hmm. I just think it's interesting because especially, you know, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll get into it. Like at the back of issue five, the issue that comes out in September, September 29th. I don't think this counts as a spoiler because it's literally just a write up from your team about, you know, how you're thinking about it. It's interesting because it's, it's kind of like you're you're all talking about how there's finite plans for the book, but it's also there's much more expansive plans. And then simultaneously with that, it kind of seems like you're all contending with whether or not the standard ideas of what a comic should be, you know, like arc after arc, for example. It's just like this right. is how it always works. Right. It, it seems like you're all contending with that idea not necessarily appealing to you right now. And I think it's it's interesting hearing you say – finishing the first trade on a cliffhanger that leads into the next part, because that makes a lot of sense, both for the, the pulp nature of the story, because I feel like so many pulp serials would end with, you know, something about like next time, like find out what happened with this fight. And right. in comics, that seems unusual, but in storytelling, it's not so unusual. Right. I'm interested in where that all comes from. Like what's fueling, that write up in the back of number five. Is it a reaction to how the first arc went and how long it was? Is it where comics are headed or, or like what's, what's driving that? Because it seems like, uh, you know, it's something you all are really contending with right now. Well, I, I think it, it's, it's hard to get your word out to everyone about your publishing plans. If you're not just going to publish it monthly, you know, if, if you're not publishing it monthly, when are you coming out? Okay. Which I completely understand. I, I, I feel exact same way. It's like, if, if a book doesn't come out at some regular point, I assume it's not coming out. It's been canceled. And that's what most people do. But we know for a fact that Adventure Man is a long-term project. Um, but we also realize that we can only produce X number of Adventure Men a year. And so... What we're, what we're trying to let everyone know is that, and if we can make it work, is that once a year you'll have new Adventure Man. Um, and once a year you'll have a new collection. So depending on how you want to read the book, um, you can either every year at a certain point there will be a new collection. And I think we're, our real plan is that we had a longer gap getting this next arc out just because of the reality of um, how big that first one was and how far that kind of set us back. Um, but I think we're eyeballing a lot shorter issues in order to get the book out um, annually. Um, and yeah, and and I know Matt and I both kind of look and we want to have, we'd like to have um, minimum of three collections, but I, I think we we're, we're hoping that we have at least five collections out and then people can decide if we're coming back or not. You know, we want, we want, um, we, I think we need that much length just to tell the story we want to tell. And I think um, for readers, you know, it'll be a great, you know, five books of stuff to read if we end up doing more. I mean, at this point, we have plans. To, we could go on forever because um, we have we've been touching on so many little things that we want to do. It's like, oh, we could do this. We could do this. Um, and, and the first three volumes are setting up the potential for what the book will be. The, and the book really will be the book starting with volume four. I got that vibe, which is fascinating. Yeah, that was going to be this volume, and then and then uh, it was going to be volume or issue six was going to be that next thing, and then it was going to be seven, and then issue eight, then issue nine. Then Matt realized, no, this is going to be at least issue ten, eleven, or twelve, and now he's realizing it may it's going to be issue um, fifteen, I think. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> where, where Adventure Man becomes. What, what I'm going to call like volume four, which is the thing that the thing that it 
was going to evolve into anyways. Right. Uh, but we're having a fun ride getting to that point because there's so much stuff that we need to, so much story we need to tell still. Plus, there's so many characters in the story that, that really need their story told uh, more. Um, that little bit of world building we're doing, we've been doing since issue one. It's all been done for a reason. And there's stuff that you're going to see in issues 10 or 14 that are still harking back to issues one and two that mm -hmm. we set up there. And um, I always like, uh, as a reader, I love, or a movie viewer, or TV show watcher, I love stuff that's rewatchable or rereadable. And these books, the more you read them, the more books that come out, the more you can go back and reread them. You know, like like Lord of the Rings or something. You know, yeah, you can go back every five or ten years and read that. And go, oh wow, I didn't. Okay, this there's all so much more stuff there. That's the idea with Adventure Man. And obviously, the main the main goal is tell for us to have fun and tell a good story and have a fun story. But long term, it's a world that we're creating, and um, and we we really want to have a, a bookshelf of really cool books that people will read for for a long time. I do think it was interesting reading that write up and like how there were, you know, the third arc would, in theory, as it stands now, have multiple one-off stories, kind of one-shots. And then the second arc, you know, is is going to be a slightly different flavor. And is part of all of this coming from the fact that this is your baby, you're doing it, you can do it how you want. And so while the traditional line of thinking would be, let's just jump into what this book is going to end up being eventually in the second arc, Instead, because it's your baby, you can set it up how you want and you can make it more robust and you can have the fun that you want along the way to the place you're ending up anyways. Exactly. No, that, that's exactly it. Um, you know, this this goes back to even the very first issue. Matt sent me 21 pages of script. So the first issue was going to be 21 pages. Was it All like nice. 42 or something? 60. 60. Ah, sorry for undercutting you. <laughs> yeah. So you can see we plan on this being – no, no. I mean long term we always plan on these being – I've always seen these being as hardcover collections that I love European comics. I love how those books work every year. There's a new Tintin. There's a new, um, uh, uh asterisk. There, at least there used to be. So every year there's a brand new story. We just have put, made that we're just giving you more story instead of a 48 page book. We're giving you a hundred and you know, 50 pages or, or whatever. We're going to be pulling back on that a bit because we needed to tell so much story in that first year to get the story started and like like i said with the that very first issue was 21 pages but once i got the script matt had wrote written as as just a very marvel style plot and i i came back to it and i said we got to develop these characters more and so i came back with 32 pages of story and we got to 32 pages and realized you know what we haven't seen claire yet <laughs> <laughs> who is the protagonist of our story and so we wrote that out to 38 pages and got that basically figured out. And then Matt, Matt realized, you know, we're just introducing her and she hasn't actually done anything yet. <laughs> and so that turned out to be 60 pages to get all that, all that, all introduce 500 characters and, and get to know who all of them were and have a, have a story you want to come back to in issue two. That's amazing. This reminds yeah. me. It yeah. sounds like probably how uh, Robert Kirkman and Chris Somney ended up having an introduction story that was an entire trade paperback before their first issue was released for Firepower. Exactly. No, it's exactly the same thing. It, it wasn't planned, but we did learn that we knew that with Arc 2, we weren't going to do that. We were going to do, we were shooting for an average of 24 pages. Um, issue, issue 5 is 26, 20, and then 6, 7, and 8 are all 20 around 22 pages so we're though even matt matt's kind of chomping on the bits kind of or under the i don't know what you want to say he's he's being kind of restrained on that he still wants to spread those out but the thing is in order for us to get this these books out we got to kind of cut a couple things and save it for next time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so we're this 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 arc is going to you know be 100 and even though we're cutting back it's still going to be close to 120 pages i think um and so I think next year, the third volume, third and fourth, fifth volumes are, are going to be less than 100 mm -hmm. because I just want I, I don't want people to wait anymore. And I don't think we need to. I don't think I think the stories, there's enough story there to satisfy people. Um, and uh, well, that's, that's the plan. Yeah. You know, I think it's interesting that you said, you know, it's like you like the kind of European style, like the album style. Wasn't the collect the collection was larger, considerably larger than like the, the the dimensions of a normal comic, right? Correct. The, the the collection is actually one to one to a European uh, book. Mm -hmm. it, it's, and that's the thing is, I actually draw the book and color the book to the European proportions. And so I have a second, I have two sets of um, 
of templates I use uh, for uh, my pages. And I designed the, the original artwork to be drawn to work at both uh, European standard and American standard. And the difference is European pages, if you had them be the same height, European pages are about an inch wider. Mm. So actually, when you get the U.S. comic book, the Adventure Man 5 in September, there's actually about a half inch of artwork on each side that you don't see, but you will see in the collection mm. and larger. Um, so it, this is the same story. It's just there's a, just a slight different um, um, it's minor different uh, visual perception of how you're going to read that story. I just think you're going to in the big collection, you're going to get a more widescreen feel of the book, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, and you know, you get to see all the details and, and it's the true size that uh, it's meant to be printed at. And, uh, the colors are better cause it's better paper and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I get a chance actually to do, to correct mistakes and, and do a lot of color corrections. And like, if you look at the difference between the actual, the conk books and the, and the hardcover collection, there's a lot of, a lot of changes I made in the coloring. I have to say you're selling me on the collection right now. I only have the single issues. Now I got to go out and buy the hardcover. Thanks, Terry. <laughs> the, good, the good thing about the good thing about the, the comics themselves, they all have all have a unique cover that will really only be in there, I think. And then they have the back matter. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, it's a different read. I think it's uh, it, it's cool. I mean, I, I, I'm an, immune to it because I I draw it and I know what's going on. But I'm really curious to have someone like analytically read the issues and then read the comic and just see kind of a test on how something reads and how something doesn't read. Cause it'd be interesting how those, those changes of that, that wide screen, that little bit extra room, extra detail, how that affects uh, the reading of the book. Cause I don't know, I assume it has some effect, but uh, it'd be very subtle. You everybody. I want to take a quick second to talk about Macroverse. Macroverse is a next-gen mobile comics app, with its tap story format making comics feel totally native on mobile devices, which you can experience over 45 series and 400 episodes, with more launching all the time. It's a perfect time to try it out, too. Many of the most popular titles like Hex 11, Dead Town, Glitch, and more are free for a limited time only, so download the app for iOS or Android and binge away. Oh, and keep an eye out on Macroverse.com for some major updates on new creators, new series, and new features that bring real collectability to digital comics in a new way. Massive things are coming. If you love making, reading, and or collecting comics, you won't want to miss what Macroverse is launching this summer. And now, back to the show. I do like how, related but unrelated, that the collection, according to that write-up in the back either will be or will be soon available in eight different languages already, including Bulgarian. Bulgarian, Dutch, English, yeah. French, German, Italian, Portuguese, and Spanish. And I think that's kind of cool because, you know, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, I'm a sports fan, so I'm going to make an analogy to sports. But, like, uh, I was talking to somebody recently about how, like, sports cards are more popular, or uh, football is like, the most popular American sport, but it's of the, amongst the... American sports, it's the least popular globally. It's mm -hmm. the, it's the most very specific, you know, it, it doesn't have as broad of appeal. And I think a lot of things or a lot of art that's created does have a certain regionality to it, even in comics. And one thing I think is really cool about Adventure Man, whether you're talking about, you know, Matt's daughter or like older audiences or people in Bulgaria or whatever, right. there's a certain right. universality to it. And I think that that is one of the cool things about the book and one of the reasons why it makes a lot of sense that you have this focus on having this great tome that comes out eventually, but also making sure it gets into other languages. Also that helps from a business standpoint, because getting in other languages will make sure that you make more money off of one collection. Exactly. And that, and that, the thing is this, this is from working in comic books for 25 years before I did this. I mean, I was already working on Adventure Man, but before it came out is I, I, I've already worked for two, two different series for European publishers and so I've already made connections and those books have been translated. So I've made connections with all these other publishers and I knew by putting just me and having someone specifically handle our rights who I worked with, I, I work with, uh, dealing with it. Uh, and I help, we help pick the actual publisher we're going to go with. Um, it was a specific part of the business ant or adventure man. Uh, I called him businessman. <laughs> <laughs> it's a part of the adventure man. Um, business plan. Uh, yeah. Business plan. Because, um, 
you know, working on independent books or creator owned books, you don't get that much money up front. It's all back end. And so I, it's something I really wanted to do. Matt really wanted to do. And I, and I just told Matt how I go, if we can get this book translated in all these languages and published in all these languages, it's just extra money that allows us to continue doing the book. And that's the plan. It, it's figuring out ways to finance uh, the book. Mm-hmm. And it's working. It's it's working well. I mean, that was I'm, I couldn't be happier that, you know, to get to get uh, get into eight languages within the first year of the book is amazing. And and um, and I know that uh, the best way for me to continue doing the book is actually to do the book, have people buy the book then buy the next book and buy the next book. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like I have to get like three volumes out in order for us to sustain uh, the publishing plan because mm-hmm. it's something this, this like i've said i think this is something i can all be working on for for years as long as uh you know we stay healthy and get the book out because uh there's so much stories i want to tell and there's so much um things that i can still learn and grow grow uh and add and uh, as, as an artist as a creator it's um it's extremely rewarding to be creating new fun stuff mm-hmm a lot of times you get caught into a trap where you're only doing certain projects for for the for the companies or even your maybe your own creator on the book but you know um and you get stale as an artist and uh, you know I have no interest in just being okay or average I, I my only goal is to do phenomenal work someday <laughs> I'm not saying I'm doing it now but to be a phenomenal artist producing interesting stuff that interests me and hopefully interests other people yeah you know that's that's what gets me out of bed in the morning so I do think it's interesting. So you said that you're going to have kind of a yearly plan for for Adventure Man. And I've actually heard other creators doing that. Like Rob Guillory has written about that for Farmhand, about how he's kind of switching to like a yearly model. Other ones I've I've heard from are, are thinking about the same thing. And I don't know. I mean, I think it's interesting because one part of creator-owned comics that people really forget about is you're drawing this, you're coloring this, but the job does not stop there. Like right. you're talking about negotiating foreign licensing deals. You're talking about, I mean, you're talking to me right now. You're talking about all kinds of stuff in terms of promotion. Right. I imagine that Adventure Man, even beyond just the 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 art aspect of it, is considerably more work than pretty much anything else you've done before. Yeah, no, no it's I, I've I've been working on Adventure Man for. I think the summer I started working on pages in the summer of 2016. So I've been working on Adventure Man almost full time for five years. Um, I've done and I probably have 40 or 50 covers a year in that time, and I've done uh, some other stuff too. But really, that's that has been my my life for the last five years is that project, and it, it, I would only be doing that if it was something I really enjoyed doing, mm-hmm. and something I loved, and it is is all time it's all consuming. All those things you mentioned, plus checking the lettering, plus checking. Um, I have to sign off on the book every single page before it goes to print. Um, I've made myself available to um, all the publishers, all the foreign publishers, so I, I get all their questions they have because I want them to produce a book that looks as good as the book that we produced, and and the readers are get, those readers are getting whatever they need from from us. Not and I want these things just to feel like cheap translations because I feel like that I've seen some versions of 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 translated books that just don't have that love to it and since the adventure man is like a work of you know a love for uh, for all of us uh, i think it's really important that the foreign reader all the readers feel like they're getting a, you know the best version of the book and the books have been amazing the, i have the the french the french and italian versions are spectacular and uh everything else i've seen so far looks great so i'm i'm, I'm super happy and you know it's consistency it's it's brand management you know we, we want we want this to be a high quality product and and uh, i say product you know what i mean yeah, yeah. And, uh, um it seems to be working and that that was that was my goal all along is that uh you know uh make these contacts make this thing you know it's like opening a movie worldwide you build a buzz and that's, you know, it's it's going to catch up a little bit here. And pretty soon I think these books are going to come out a little bit closer together, the foreign versions. Um, and so when I go online on Twitter or on Instagram and I say, hey, Adventure Man, and people across the world can go, oh, this will be out. I can follow my my local publisher and find out when this will be. And I just I just think it's it's just a healthy way to uh, keep the keep the fans uh, into it and get bring in new fans because not having people wait, having to wait or never know if their book's going to be there or having to get pirated versions or, or whatever. 
Um, so yeah, no, I, as a fan myself, that's, I would, lo- I love getting the, the best version of, of whatever that, that book is, you know, the foreign books, I buy like foreign books I actually buy most of the actual foreign versions because they're so nice. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to read it in your own language. I do think it's, you know, you, you mentioned product and then kind of backed off of it a little bit and understandably, I, kn- I know sometimes it can seem a little craven to like feel, I mean, to, to say things like that. It's like when I describe my own stuff as content, I don't really like saying that because I right. feel like it's just like, it makes it sound like it's like calories for somebody to consume rather than something that I've actually worked really hard on. Right. But I do think it's, I mean, it's super important to look at that stuff because if you had inconsistent standards across all those you know releases uh, across right. all the different languages it wouldn't be the same i mean like that's you look at you mentioned movies but i actually just read this article the other day about how have you ever heard of the netflix show money heist yeah okay i have not and I was, apparently it is the most popular show for netflix worldwide it is yeah. the number one most watched show and i do think it's interesting how i mean it is a very necessary thing if you're creating art to think globally a lot of times to think about how like this is going to translate because unlike Netflix, Netflix is, you know, you watch in, in Spain or you watch in, you know, I don't know, like Thailand or wherever, it's going to be roughly the same show where you can change the captions and change everything like that. But you're not going to have that easy standard. You have to make sure that the quality is the same. And if you don't do that, then all of a sudden a potential adventure man fan could be somebody who says this person didn't care to put out a good product. So why should I care about buying it? Yeah. 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 It's, 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 you know, I, I think it just has to go, goes along with the fact that, uh, I put so much time. We all put so much time, but I, I specifically, I know for myself, I put so much time into it. I, I want everyone to be happy with, uh, to, you know, to experience at least what I'm experiencing, you know, the, the, the joy that I have creating it that hopefully they, they are able to, uh, to to get that out of the book so do you feel like okay so you know again about a year gap obviously the world has slightly changed over that time have you changed the way that you think about this book or even your art during that time because it's it's a lot of time you change like you said that you're always trying to be like a better artist like has there been any shift for you as you know between collection one and where you're at now well, it, it, it was question one was such a huge learning curve as far as creating this gigantic world or worlds. And so having that gigantic part of that done, it freed me up to spend more time just drawing the pages. I'm doing way less sketchbook stuff for these for these issues. I'm, I, I kind of know where I'm going. I, I figured out the coloring schemes and um, and, and I figured out um, ways to simplify penciling and color or penciling and inking because there's things I can do in the color. And, um, you know, uh, it, Rachel had to work extremely hard, uh, on a lot of these pages. Um, cause they're so detailed way more than I usually do. And so I, I've been figuring out ways to have the pages. I look at just as good, but not be as time consuming for her to ink because, you know, she's, she, there's like blood and tears on those, on those pages for her. Cause she had to just work so hard on them. And, and it's like, that's not fun. I don't want her, I don't want her or me or me, the colorist having to work any harder than necessary. Let's, let's, let's be smart and pick a couple of things to kind of simplify the drawings down in places to speed up both the production. And I think actually, honestly, I think it makes it a better read if you can, not show detail everywhere. You 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 silhouette things. You uh, drop out backgrounds, which is all things I learned by drawing monthly comic books for fifteen or twenty years. I mean, I learned all this stuff, and then it's a matter of of um, balancing uh, the simplicity with the need to show everything that the reader has to see. Um, and uh, this this book, I show way more setups and, and details of stuff because I really want people to, to feel this is an immersive world. But then it's I sometimes I get caught up in those details and I, I find myself I've spent over half a day drawing some details on stuff. And it's like, I don't know if I need to do this. I think I could draw like four or four percent of this, indicate the rest of it in ink and color. You know, it just it is necessary. And I've so now let's 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 focus on what really needs to be focused on. Yeah. Spend the time a little bit smarter. 
So I don't, I don't regret what I, what I did on the first of arc because it needed to be done. I'm glad I did it there. And, and now I don't have to do it that as, as much. And let's make it a, make it a, just as much fun to, or more fun to actually produce it than, than the work it was to produce the first one. Yeah. You talked about this, I think in a art feature interview we did on sketched, but, and then you, and you just mentioned it too. It's just, I mean, that's one of the things that's really underrated about the the first arc is that all these characters are new. I mean, not just like it's not just Claire, like Claire is a fairly usual person. But when you're talking about the the, the crew of Baron Bazaar and you talk about the crew of Adventure Man and everything like that, those are completely new creations. And like right. even beyond that, like you literally invented a building in in uh um, in the city and it's just these are these are substantial changes and i do think it's interesting that you're able to simplify a bit both in the sense that you maybe are thinking about your art a little differently but also in like the second arc you don't have to do all that heavy lifting now it's just get down and draw the book i do want to say though so um this is cruel because i've read the sixth issue and readers aren't gonna be able to read it for a bit but i did want to note one thing in that 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 sixth issue the first spread which i can't show you in full in its full glory because and it's for listeners it is of adventure man punching a car basically but you can't like the problem is uh, like the ipad can't show it on two pages so i'm reading like a spread in like two different ones i have to admit that's part of what triggered that that question because that spread is absolutely incredible and it might be my favorite thing that you've done in the book so far okay cool but it's interesting because it felt a little different for you i'm gonna make a comparison it almost feels more like goran parlov like oh let me say when i say something is goran parlov like that's about as high of a compliment as i can possibly oh, yeah, give sure. yeah no he's awesome and yeah, it's it's interesting though because there was like a like a <laughs> it almost feels more like a the simplicity a european artist would give it Right. And and I love that. Like there is a real energy to it because you simplified a little bit on like some of the details and everything. Right. It actually kind of reminded me of a conversation I had with Chris Somney about what he's doing, where it's like the further he gets in his career, the more he's about like limiting his lines, mm-hmm. simplifying yep. the process. And that sounds like it should be faster. It isn't always necessarily faster, but it does make it more striking and i think that there's some i don't even know why but it just felt like there were subtle differences to your approach in that issue and that double page spread really showed that for me um well it's no it's definitely a fact that since 2001 i've been more influenced by european artists than american artists and that is uh, especially in the last decade especially adventure man uh as far as uh page layouts and storytelling and I don't even call it. I call it like set shots. Um, the way in, in European comics, I think they'll use a half page uh, setting up a, a, a scene with little tiny figures. And then like what, would, what we would consider money shots are, are down to little quarter size panels. Mm-hmm. They'll use their giant money shot for a scene for a bunch of buildings and a little tiny person walking in the background. But the thing is, when you come away from that is, is this you really have a sense of where you are and it's it's almost more beautiful that, that little, those little tiny things are way like, more beautiful than a, a beautifully rendered person, which is counterintuitive, but there's just a sense of beauty in landscape, let's say. You know, when you go see mountains or whatever, there's, there's you know, that, um, that, that feeling you get of, uh, of beauty. Um, and that's, that has been a conscious plan of mine on um, probably my primary objective when I'm drawing Adventure Man is that um, – the main focus isn't necessarily the characters. It's it's the the scene that we're in. How do I make that um, impactful on the reader? And because uh, I think I think it just sticks with you way longer. It really helps you be a much more immersive place. And the thing is, it takes a lot more time to do. Yeah. Even though it looks like oh, I'm just drawing little tiny figures. That's that must be really easy to draw. However, that pay, that that panel took a whole day to do because it just you got to set it correctly. Uh, it's a lot of design, and then once you commit to it, it's a lot of work. You know that design's got to be good. You know it's got to be solid. It's got to be a solid composition. And uh, and the thing is, I can always save myself on the color. I can I can always come back in, and just put put a spotlight where it needs to be. Um, but um, that's something that I I am 100% consciously trying to do in my work, and have been this less last five years. And the thing is, the funny thing is, uh, how that impacts my uh, Marvel or DC pages. 
because uh, when I when I do those pages now, it, they're not like how I used to do them. I definitely have have come into a uh, a mix of European and American comics, and I mm-hmm. feel like Adventure Man is definitely at least I I, I mean it, it's, it's got to be because you you even mentioned it. It's definitely a mix of the two. I'm trying to find the best of best of American, best of Western, I guess, and best of European comics. Um, there's a, I think there's a there's a pretty good uh, middle ground there to play with because you know. European comics are traditionally like nine panels with a bunch of little tiny characters. And then American comics are traditionally three to four or five panels with a bunch of with big splashes. And I'm trying to tr- trying to combine that because that's what there's so much stuff I love in both. And I th- really feel like it's a happy there is a happy medium there that, yeah. we, can, that we can hit. And Spend Adventure Man happens to be a, a story that has allows me to hit all those hit all those those things. I do have to admit there's like a, this one moment in issue six where Claire does a heel click. And, and it's funny because like, that's like this moment that stands out to me, but I feel like it kind of fits what you're talking about where it's not just, it's not just like, it's not just the effort that goes into the page, but it's also on what you focus on. It's, it's about what, what is deemed valuable in terms of what you put on the page and what you put in panels and everything like that. And like, that was like a little moment that had like a lot of character to it. And like, you had stars around her feet and everything like that. I love that little beat, but I think that if like, you know, this isn't me casting aspersions on like Marvel or DC, but if, if you were working on a Marvel or DC book, that wouldn't have existed. Right. You wouldn't have that beat because it's not valued in the same way. And I think that that's cool that you can kind of, express the style you want but also express the values you have in the storytelling in this book yeah matt matt gives me enough rope to hang myself with (laughs) i think it's a bad phrase i guess but that's fairly true he gives he i get a pretty loose plot or or, or a few pages or whatever however we end up doing that particular issue and i'm influenced by you know all the european stuff but i you know one of my touchstones for for me since i was uh, 15 is, is Bill Watterson's, uh, you know, Calvin and Hobbes, that, that kind of stuff. There's so much genius in Calvin and Hobbes that you can apply to superhero books and you can apply to this, the stuff that I do. You don't have to draw on it, that cartoony of a style, but there's just things that work, the sound effects and the star things. And, you know, those little fun, little, you push, pushing the, uh, the pushing the storytelling or the acting to a little more, slightly more cartoony. Uh, edge and matt matt's calls sometimes what i do is i i, I have a disney disneyfication going on in my artwork because <laughs> i love animation i love comics but i love animation as well and i think there's a point where you go too far but there is a there's a point that i'm hitting in my art and we'll see if this ha- this this changes as this book goes on and i have more fun but i do feel like it's going to be a bit more uh Cartoony is a fairly tough word to use because I think the backgrounds and everything are going to be like they are. But I do feel like we'll see more a loosening up of my stuff just mm-hmm. because I, I can see in places where it really does work. And you got to be careful because for some, for some, sometimes it makes things feel too funny or cartoony. But the great cartoonists can convey so much more um, range of emotions with so few lines. And so that's, you're basically saying I can do more with less. And, um, and, and, and as an artist who's worked, you know, on basically on everything, it, it's fun to find, um, ways to convey, uh, emotion or ideas or whatever, using a little bit slightly more cartoony. Um, but, um, it took years and years and years of drawing in a more realistic style in, in order to learn what I needed to learn in order to push that thing. And the thing is, it just happens. Like I'll just draw it and it's, it's there. And it's like, I'm leaving it, yeah. <laughs> you know? I'm not, I go that it's I've nailed whatever this is. I'm not going to touch it. And um, so a lot of times I have to, I'll erase and go back and, and correct it, especially if I'm doing a Marvel or DC project. I'll, I'll take that back out because it's a little too inconsistent. But for Adventure Man, I think uh, once I color it, I think there's a level of consistency that kind of glosses those things over. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, but the heel click that was that was me. Matt said something about Claire running off. You know, at the end of, uh, out of this panel, and I, I just said, oh, you know what? Now that she's, she's, you know, adventure, adventure mom now or whatever, she has a little bit of extra ability. To actually, even though it's as cartoony as that is, she could do that. Oh yeah, she now has that ability. So it, it's subtle, but it, that it could actually happen. But it was, it was the the absolute like spot on um, mood she was in, and yeah. the the story needed to represent. Yeah, 
I think it's, you know, it's interesting you brought up uh, Calvin and Hobbes. Like another one that I it kind of reminds me of, obviously not similar, but in just like what you're talking about is uh, Jeff Smith's Bone in the mm-hmm. sense that a lot of Bone had cartoony elements like the stars, the bones themselves, everything like that. But then everything in terms of like the valley was done in a very realistic fashion and, and the environments were done in a really realistic fashion. And it's interesting because I don't know, there's a... I don't know what it is about the blending of those. Maybe it is the animation aspect, like the the animation roots to a lot of this. But that ties into the universality that we're talking about, where it, it gives it this feel that anyone could read this and just kind of get it. And I don't know what it is about that, but it just jives. Yeah, no, it, I mean, obviously it's it's, it's peanuts or, it's, or whatever. There's a, there is a clarity in vision. You know, it's a stick man kind of thing. Go back to a stick man. That's the most easiest thing to read. Um, but, uh, but Bone, for instance... Bone came out, I got my first issue of Bone the month that I started working full-time in comics. And so that that has been a gigantic influence on me. That I'm, I, I never, I rarely mention it. I've only talked to, I mentioned it to Jeff Smith in person a few times, but the what he did and how he does stuff has been a huge influence on me. I mean, uh, it's great to be, to have a job like I do where I get to just draw things, but I draw things because I look at things and they go in my brain and then they come out. And mm-hmm. Uh, my range of influences are so broad that it's you, it's hard to tell who who's influencing that thing. Um, but yeah, there's um, 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 a big influence of, of that simpler style of stuff is is there. And uh, if the thing is, you can't I can't in my style directly do that stuff because it, again, it just pops out. It's figuring out you know what, what your that, version of that is. Yeah, my language. Mm-hmm. What's that language? I think that's maybe that's the best word. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun to play with. Yeah, it it is interesting because it's like I can see the same idea in all three. They're just executed differently. Yeah. And and like that's that's awesome. OK, well, I'm going to close with a few things that are uh, not related to Adventure Man necessarily. I, I do want to bring up. I think the the first place I ever met you was at like Emerald City Comic Con. I like I think of you as a big convention guy, and I am interested in you know where you have this art coming up. There is a deluge of events coming up. I mean, there was just Rose City mm-hmm. on the horizon. Our C two E two Emerald City New York. Um, I think Thought Bubble. Yeah, Thought Bubble's happening. I mean, assorted regional ones as well, not just the big ones. How are you feeling about conventions? Like, is that something that could be on your horizon or is, are you still a little wibbly wobbly on it? Oh, well, I mean, it was amazing to see what a difference it made, uh, how much I missed conventions. Now, the thing is, the funny thing for me is, is that I'd actually really got it down to a science. I'd say these last three or four years were actually enjoyed going to conventions, but I, I limited it to uh, every year I did Emerald City which I can drive to. I did every year I did uh, San Diego, which I've done since 1991. You know, and I made that, you know, the certain you know, six to seven days. And then, and then New York I've gone to like for like a decade. So those three are my definite show that I do every year. And, but the thing is, those are all spaced out, you know, four months, five months apart. And so yeah, they're all condensed. Yeah. And, um, so, and then I try to do like one or two more things, like, like a European trip or just some other city or region hit and so i loved it man it was such a blast doing those places going to those places first of all i love the cities i love the people there and then the shows are great shows um they're big enough that i get to see everybody i want to see and i know how to handle those shows i know how to handle new york and i know how to handle san diego i've learned over the years what i need to do in order to make the show accessible for me or enjoyable for me and, and for the fans as well that i don't get all burned out talking to them um, I, I hired someone to help run my table cause I was, I really needed a break from, from being there all the time. And so now that the, the, the this year without shows, um, yeah, I, I can't wait to go back. I just, um, I was going to go to Rose city, but I decided not to. So I still, I still might go to, um, Seattle for Emerald city in, in September or in December, but I guess in theory, I will return to normal in, in 2022. I mean, adventure man's out now and I really should be at the shows promoting, but both because of my work schedule and just the, you know, um, the weirdness of the times we're in, I, I, I'm not 100% comfortable yet 
you know, being in public with that many people. And, uh, and, you know, I, I honestly would rather wait until I can see people face to face. I feel it's, you know, I, after a year of being by my, not by myself, but being, you know, inside working all this time to finally get back out to shows and only be able to talk to people through a mask. And, um, which I know is there for a good reason, but, um, you know, it's that contact we're making with people. It's we're, 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 we're used to reading people's faces and it's kind of hard to do that, especially I'm meeting so many people I don't know, or maybe I won't recognize them with a mask on that has me a little, a little hesitant until that gets uh, back to normal. And then, you know, maybe I won't and I'll just have to deal with it then. Yeah. It is interesting though. Cause it's, I've found like the last year fascinating from an artist standpoint, cause I've seen like a lot of artists kind of develop like replacements for convention experiences mm-hmm. where like, yeah. I know that like comic sketch art, for example, was doing all these things where they're like, remote signatures where you sign stuff and then like you they mail it and everything and um, maybe that stuff existed before and i didn't really realize it but it seems like there's a lot of the convention experiences are almost being formalized in a way that for the people who rely on that for income like i i know like one thing you would regularly do is uh an art book that you would have Mm -hmm. at emerald city and it's it's interesting to see how people are coming up with new solutions for that stuff until or until they're comfortable but also maybe after they're still comfortable and they're still going to conventions and it just maybe ex- expands their footprint yeah i know um i know i did virtual I, I did a virtual um uh emerald city and then WonderCon san diego and new york last year where i offered up for like a week in my shop uh run by andrea dimonacos uh white squirrel uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, did, does amazing work and it's very amazing to work with. It makes my life a lot easier. Um, but setting up a week long shop for each show where we offered specific things plus doing sketches and stuff. But then as the year went on, the sketch things started going back a bit because I really needed to get back to work. Um, it was fun doing the sketches for people and posting those up as I did them, posting up the videos of them because just to give people this sense of interaction. Mm-hmm. But now that we're kind of back to a little bit more back to normal, I haven't ha- haven't really felt that much of a need to do it. Um, but um, yeah, I think I might even do something maybe for New York virtually, just because I haven't I haven't done much this year. Uh, and then with Adventure Man out, I really need to promote it. Uh, so maybe I'll tie something in with New York and hopefully uh, Seattle. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's a great way to uh, to connect. You know, having having your signatures or whatever be able to get to everybody worldwide, as opposed to just those hundred thousand people that can make it to that show that weekend. It's actually opened the door up quite a bit. Um, but it's that it's the one on one interaction with people is what, you know what we miss. And, yeah, uh, and going out and getting coffee or meals with people and stuff is is huge. I haven't decided if I'm going to go to Emerald City yet. I have a press pass, but I don't. I just don't know yet. It really depends to a certain degree. I, I reached out to my hotel and be like, hey, uh, what's the cancellation policy? Because it right. just, you know, you don't, I, I remember I got stuck with a little bit of stuff for Emerald City last year. Understandably, I mean, like, nobody predicted this, but right. it's just, it's such an odd thing. But anyways, all right, let's close with something happy or relatively happy because I haven't watched the episode yet. For listeners that have not watched any of Ted Lasso or up until The previous week's episode in which the team played in the FA Cup semifinals against Manchester City. I highly advise you not listening to this part. Or if you're just not interested in Ted Lasso, you probably are not going to be interested in this part. (laughs) Both Terry and I are big Ted Lasso fans. So I'm curious on your perspective because I feel like we've had... You know, whenever something gets really popular, there's always going to be a backlash to a certain degree. I think Ted Lasso's gotten a little bit of it. Like where it's like some people are down on the second season because it's not just the... you know, major league, but with Jason Sudeikis being the happiest person in the history of the world, which maybe like turn people off a little bit. What's your season two take? Some people are mixed. Are you in or out? Oh, I'm in. I'm, I'm, but you know, obviously after season one was flawless. I mean, it was just an amazing bit of skill of writing that and the acting and, and, and as, as what a tonic for, for oh, the yeah. times. That we right need. time and place for sure. It couldn't have, it couldn't have been, it was, I think we, I came out maybe in our, we started watching October, I think. And I think we, we watched it between October and January. I think we watched it three times. So it was just felt so good. And the thing is, I'm like that 1% target audience for it. I'm a fan of, um, American college football and I'm a fan of English premier. <laughs> so yeah. I am, I am that 1% they are trying to, to hit, but that aside, it's just a tremendous show. I love British humor and comedy and settings anyways. And so, 
Yeah, I love the show. The second season, now what what, what I can see just from looking my, my my observations is that the first season was all thirty minute episodes. The second season, they are thirty five minutes, forty minutes, and now we're in a string here of forty five minute episodes, three in a row. Yeah, which is something I I think they they gave the writers as much rope as they wanted, and so it's like I. Th- there's a lot of good stuff in here, but I also do think that that they could use a bit more editing on this season. Sure. As much as I'm enjoying it, I, I could see how if this had to be squeezed into 35 minutes or 30 minutes, it'd be super tight. You know, the fun, one of the funniest episodes of this season was the fourth one, which was the Christmas Christmas one. Yeah. And it was 30 minutes on the nose. It's by far the shortest episode, and it's the most bang for your buck as far as feeling like last season's Ted Lasso. However. Uh, every time a new episode comes out, we watch we watch it late Thursday night, and then we watch it again Friday, so we can kind of catch everything again. And um, uh, we're enjoying it; it's great. Uh, the 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 new one that comes out um, today, uh, we we watch this morning, and it's you know it's an episode that, that unlike any of the other episodes, which is you know we're uh, 19 episodes in and have something completely fresh like that. I mean, these guys are having a, a blast with the show. Yeah, it's like the Coach Beard one, right? Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. I, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for that. I do think it's interesting. It's, I wonder how much, like, I, I agree with you. I do think that to a certain degree, some of the stuff is, I don't want to say stretched out, because I think that a, a lot of this stuff is given the time it needs. But I do wonder how much some of, like, the the, the broader response has been because the first season was such a balm. And then this second season is a little bit more like, you know, I mean, not everything is always cheerful and like maybe you got to deal with that. And I do think it's really smart of them to still have like the heart of the show, but be real about it at the same time. Because yeah. it's like if somebody's always like, I mean, if somebody was constantly like, you know, the scenes with Ted and, uh, oh my god, I'm completely forgetting the name of the doctor. The therapist. Yeah, the scenes with those two are really fascinating because it's definitely Ted at his most annoying because he's deliberately panic. He, he's panicking, and like the way Jason Sudeikis is doing that is really underlining that there's something wrong with him, even when he's not actually expressing what's wrong with him you know it's really it's yeah. really great acting it's amazing i'm just making i'm just thinking of the scene with him on the couch oh yeah. trying to get on the couch and he tries it here should I here and then he tries like seven different positions on the on, the, on her couch to get comfortable and so funny it is so good um i i what my my takeaway from it i think is that they are setting stuff up I oh, think yeah. they're taking the time to set everything up and yeah. And, and they're developing a much richer world, which I think in the end is going to pay off so much more the, you know, I feel like they're, they have a, this map and they know exactly where they're going with it. And, uh, and, uh, I think by episode 12, we'll, we'll be like blown away by what they accomplish. I'm fully ready to hate Nate. I feel like it's coming. I'm, I, yeah. I feel like it's coming. I don't want it. Cause I love Nate in the first season. And now and it is fascinating. Cause you're talking about like rewatching stuff or, or like, you know, Lord of the Rings or, you know, adventure man and everything like that. And picking up on stuff. It is interesting because they definitely seeded his turn to a certain degree, even in the first season where yeah. he was always like this. We just read it as like, personal growth and in reality it's like maybe it's also partially a reveal of the not so happy sides of this character yeah 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 it's great i mean uh or um how enriching they've made so many of these characters right roy, roy and his niece you oh, know yeah. roy roy coaching the, the little girl soccer team um um uh, they're just you know uh, seeing more of um um the executive blink on his name now oh uh um, family yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god, I can't believe I'm completely spacing it right yeah, now. Yeah, the episode last night. I'm blinking now. First the H. Oh, Higgins. Right. Higgins. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's 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 fun. It, there's. I'm really curious. I mean, as much as I'm enjoying it and, uh, and, and you know taking in all of it, it's it it's it, they've really set up a soap opera as well, which mm-hmm. is that uh, that what's gonna ha- where's this all gonna lead? Because I I think that the I think they're playing th- for a third season. I, and I have a guess where I think they're going with it. Um. And uh, but I'm just enjoying the minutia of it now because mm-hmm. because I realize how good it actually is 
And though I'm disappointed that some of these episodes are so long, they're telling so much story that we're not, there's not that super hyper focused, funny, funny or emotional that it was in the first season. I think long term it's gonna it's gonna play better. Um, and I'm just trying to enjoy every minute of it. You know, when, they, when songs come up in the background, I have to figure out what those songs are, and because mm-hmm. they all have a meaning to them. You know, it's not random that they're doing those songs. The song, the song that um, that Higgins and Rebecca do the do the scat to that you think it's just a jazz scat? It's actually that cream song that it plays at the end of that episode. <laughs> I didn't figure it out until I played it a couple of times, but it's such a great little catchy song. And I go, that's the song. They're, they're not doing a jazz scat. They're actually doing this cream song from 1967. That's amazing. <laughs> they're just like layering in so many things. I'm with you though. I'm actually a college football fan and a, a, a soccer fan as well. And so it is, it is nice. I have to admit one weird thing that I always kind of, I always want more of the actual sport and then mm-hmm. they give it to me and I'm just like, yeah, I know. Now I know why they're not doing it to a certain sure. degree. It's, it's just tough. It's not going to be their strength. Like watching the, the Manchester city uh, domination in that one episode, I was like, Oh, this is why they don't do that. That's tough. To, that's tough to do. Yeah. You know, what's funny is I actually feel they could have just cut that. Probably that could have yeah. been five minutes. Just boom. No, I'm just, Cause I think they did that in the previous season, a couple of times where they, they'd talk about a game and it, and I actually think it would have been a more effective episode had they just cut it. Probably, um, yeah. Put that, leave that in our mind as to what, um, what, how bad it was. And then we see the, you know, you know, the crowd reaction, what they see on TV tells them it wasn't good and the interviews and stuff. But uh, that would have been something where I would have maybe just taken five minutes out of that episode and it would have been that much tighter totally. of, of an episode. Yeah. Well, I am looking forward to seeing if uh, I – despise nate as i fear i might and everything else that comes with that but also what's coming with adventure man your art and everything else terry that is all i have for you thank you so much for coming on to chat about all this stuff with me i appreciate you taking the time thanks david it's been a pleasure great talking to you as always and i appreciate your your interest in everything thank you Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Off Panel with artist Terry Dodson. You can find him on Twitter and Instagram at Terry Dodson Art and his work in Adventure Man. Love Off Panel, want to support it? Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts today and give the show a rating or review while you're at it, but five stars only. You can also support the show by backing it on Patreon. Find the show at patreon.com slash offpanel, and when you back it on there, you get early access to each week's podcast as well as weekly content and more. Want even more? Subscribe to my subscription comic site, Sketched at Sketch.com, for long-form articles, interviews, and the rest of the site's content and its members-only forum. You can find Off Pound Sketched on social media by liking on Facebook at Slash Sketched. That's S-K-T-C-H-D. Follow on Twitter and Instagram at, at @sketchcomic or following me at, at Slice Fried Gold. Big thanks to all my existing patrons, including Raj Patel, Capes and Tights Podcast, Klaus Vandeven, Brian, Submit Industries, Jack Mulqueen, Kyle, Carl Kershaw, Robert Masella, Elza Chartier, Luke Nakashoji, Elliot Metz, Dr. Luke, Scott Hazelwood, Scott Buon, Michael Tunk, Canadian by Proxy, Johnny Cannon, Bradley Raider, Carl Troy, Brandon DePillis, Patrick Brower, Declan Shalvey, Dan Garino, Josh Williamson, Adam Freeman, Ben Wild, Brian Klein Q, SB, Nick Bennett, Daniel Whitfield, Susanna Pollock, Reed Hinkley Barnes, Mario Tiambang, Abducted the Comic.com, Andrew Carita, Matt Mahoney, Charlie Chu, Stephen Hall, Pensacola Pop Comics, Kim Eslin, Philip Myra, Christian Shelton, Kenny Porter, Chris Pacello, Thorne Grunbeck, Fuzz Bubbles, Christopher Ta, Transmitter Down, Waltz Comics and Books, Carl Mizell, Danny Ollie, Paul Salates, Al- Akil Wilson, Alex Dimitriopoulos, Terry Dodson, Liana Kangas, Wesley Gift, Sean Kirkham, Alistair Ross, Julio Anta, Brett A. Schmidt, Jason. Goodmanson, Paul Reinwatt, Vita Ayala, Tara Ferguson, Dave Slusher, WQ Comics, Akil Kokachi, Sean Pinello, Ken Heidelman, Philip C.V., Al Ewing, Ryan Alcock, David Kelly, Robert Wilson IV, Nick Polito, Brendan Fletcher, Jonathan Nilsson, Matthew Groom, Jason Nassi, Adam Bogart, Matthew Taylor, Nick Patera, Jacob Sorelli, Ford Gilmore, David Baraldi, Nick Hall, Bjorn Basin, John Hendricks, Steve Anderson, Ian Maxfield, Cliff Chang, Colin McMahon, Chris Palmer, Scott McGovern, Nathan Fairburn, Kat McKenzie, Adam Highfield, Fiona Staples, Mark Abnett, Mike Murphy, Michael Shirley, Tom Barnett, Jim Demonakos, Norbert, Nick Lowe, James James Kaplan, and Mission Comics and Art in San Francisco. You guys are all the best. A quick thanks to Upright T-Rex Music, who wrote and performed Ah Panel's theme song just for the show. Check out their music on Spotify because it's completely delightful. Thanks for listening, and tune in next week for another episode.